Good morning. Paris and Lois, I want to thank you for not telling me it was Confirmation Sunday because I would have been under a lot of pressure to make my sermon shorter. <laughs> so for the confirmands, I'm sorry. You know, I was never confirmed. I didn't grow up in the church, and I missed that. And, um, but I had three confirmands in my family. So I'm going to tell you right now, if you listen to the second paragraph of this sermon, and if you listen to the last paragraph of this sermon, you'll get 90% of what I'm talking about. So feel free to get distracted on those other times, but second paragraph, last paragraph, okay? Now, this is for moms and dads, because you gotta be good examples to your children. I'm gonna ask you the question, do you sometimes do things that you wouldn't do otherwise if you knew you were going to get caught? I do. I have this bad habit. I have an infinity, and it has these eight cylinders that just love to run. It'd be like asking you, son, Bolt, to trot. You know, you're on the expressway, somebody goes by you about 85 miles an hour, you go, yes. And you get behind him, and you know that he's going to get the ticket, not you. I love it. I know in that instance that I am smarter than one person, and wilier than most everybody else. Even though I don't need to hurry, even though I know it's going to be less gas efficient, I still speed. I even know that it would be just as easy not to speed because 80% of the time when I drive, I don't speed. But it's easy to speed under circumstances like that, and I do it. Now, I tell you that because I want you to know that every one of us has some things that we have to reconsider this morning when we hear a story like has been given us today. The Lord God told Moses to share with the Israelites, you shall not do. You shall not do as those in Egypt who have all the power and can make all the rules and do whatever they jolly well please. You shall not do as the Canaanites. When you get back into their land, they're going to have created gods that are pleasurable. And you're going to want to follow them because it'll be fun and easy. You shall do my ordinances and my statutes. And therefore, and here is the good news, you shall live. Today I'd like you to consider knowing yourself, not kidding yourself. I'd like you to think about yourself as a canoe rather than a piece of driftwood floating in your life's journey. Who's first in your life? I doubt that few of you, if you're like most Americans, could say it is someone other than yourself. We're a nation saturated with privilege and plenty, rich in advantage and seldom crippled by anything other than our own self-absorption. Take Iraq's oil, to the victor goes the spoils. Buy Walmart, because they put flags on everything, even though you know they couldn't be paying American wages at those prices. Fact check, who needs it? So again, let me remind you that Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, says do not do what you have the power to do if it is not in the way of the one true God. One way, says the Lord, leads to worse things. Another way leads to better things. 
and to understand the difference all the time, we need role models, traveling companions, as good as that sweet lady from Google who is in my car. She always tells me where to go. <laughs> and if I look down, I do see she also tells me I'm speeding, but she's very demure about that. It's okay to have her then. So, we're here today to talk about something. It's called a stewardship campaign. Now, mind you, I did not say a pledge giving campaign. And for some reason, known only to Paris and Lois, they let me give the talk <laughs> instead of themselves. They'd be better at it than I would, trust me. So what do I mean by a stewardship campaign? And why is its theme do the same? Not the same as our neighbor, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, but the same as Zacchaeus, the Good Samaritan, Paul and Silas as they're in prison, and that abundantly productive, tiny little mustard seed with its glorious growth. These are the four lessons of Stewardship Month. Such a path is not necessarily easy, nor is it the path often chosen. You, when faithful, are clearly the minority. Believe me, I know. I'm a financial planner. I see the tax returns of all my clients. It's my fiduciary responsibility to know their lives. I know what they do. And I can tell you right now that the most generous ones are the happiest ones. They are grateful and therefore charitable. That is our calling as friends of Jesus, the Christ to be in a relationship for which we are always grateful. Furthermore, Christians need one another to do their best. Christian living is communal living. It's folks striving to be the best, be the best they can for one another and for those to whom they are called and sent. So this year, your church is not asking you just to make a commitment of your money, but to make a commitment of your time. You get two cards instead of one. It's a, like a twofer at the grocery store. So that you can have an opportunity to make a commitment. And you can make that commitment in the context of a community that will help you be successful at it. Help you not to fall prey to the easy excuses of speeding because you can get away with it, but the better choice of doing the better thing for your fellow men and women. We want to help you have clear positive goals. You have four great examples this season and four good friends from the church thinking about this and reflecting upon these stories with you, that we can envision and improve the gifting of ourselves, gifting of the life that has been given to us by our Lord and Savior. In my younger days, now tell me how many of you can remember when you were 21? I can remember being 21. Now, come on, Mike, I know you can remember that. I was an avid handball enthusiast back in that day. I know you wouldn't believe that looking at me now, but I was then. And handball is not a game that rewards the lackadaisical. Because if you don't play handball all the time, like more than once a week, you get sore hands every time you play it. So you gotta be diligent about playing handball. And if I wanted to get better at handball, I even had to play with people who beat me, who were better than me. And I don't like losing, so that was not always easy. 
couple of months ago, I looked up a friend of mine, thank you, LinkedIn, Chuck, who was the young single guy who almost always beat me at handball, but always made me a better handball player. He's now a father of two girls. And he told me how when his girls were little, he used to amuse them by knocking things off the kitchen table while they were eating and then catching it before it hit the floor. The guy's eye-hand coordination was phenomenal. His daughters were inspired. They both went on to get scholarships in girls softball in college. Needless to say, I was content to occasionally beat him. Now I'm asking you to take a risk, to risk improving your game of stewardship, to be more than you are today, and let me tell you, it's worth it. And I'll give you just one example of that, and that's Paris. You know, when I met him, he was a pretty crummy banjo player, but he keeps practicing and practicing, by golly, he's getting better at it, don't you think? Say amen if you believe he's getting better at banjo. Amen. All right, that's good. <laughs> yeah, graciously quiet. All right, now where was I? Oh, yeah. When you make a commitment to be better, you're not always going to be successful, are you? But it's okay to fall short because in making a commitment to improve yourself, you're pointed in the right direction. And nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I'm telling you, I'm asking every one of you this year to make a commitment of your money and your time. And I know that's going to be really hard. So I'm thinking there's a possibility I might fail. But I'm still going to ask you. Because if you don't make a commitment, then you have no goal. And you have nothing to lead you forward. So, Take what you're giving this year, add a buck to it if you want, or a thousand bucks to it if you want, divide it by 12 or 52, and tell your bank to send it to the church every week or every month. It's really easy, I do that. I always do the easy thing, if at all possible. Take your time, add an hour, or three, or 10, or a lot more if you wanna be a Sunday school teacher and make a commitment to do something. Trust me, you will never enjoy more until you learn how to give more. Make a goal and keep it. Even if you're a, a giant instead of a cub, you'll feel good because you gave 100% and left it all on the field, right? So let me give you an example. This is how you can encourage one another. Terry and I volunteer at the soup kettle during the summer once a month. Two years ago, we weren't doing that at all. But someone said, you know, the people who do it 12 months a year could use a break. So could you volunteer once? We said, yeah, we'll do that. And it's fun. And it reminds us of how important it is to help people who are food deprived. And we do a good thing. There is a good thing waiting for you to do. So I'm challenging you to find your good thing. Whether it's one Saturday morning a year with our team at the Greater Elgin Food Pantry, if it's one night at the soup kettle, if it's just bringing food here once a month to people, find your good thing. You know, as they said, try it, Mikey. You might like it. And I guarantee you, it will do some good. A church that is transformational in its community ministry needs members who are transformed in their faithfulness. What if you've never been loved? Would you know how to love? What if you had never failed? Would you know how to improve? So it's imperative to us from, to learn from our life's lesson. 
and to let God's love help us do good. We adults are the lesson givers. Share the joy of your service with others and invite them to come along with you. Let's keep our light out, shining, good for the community, not hidden. Now, I'm kind of old school. My dad was a self-made guy. He always said, give it 150%. He didn't say give 110%. He didn't say give 100%. He said give 150%. That means I'm a little intense sometimes, but I would always rather stand for too much than to stand for too little. How about you? Can you find a role model? Can you find a friend that you would join in giving? A good example for us to look to, to be encouraged to do this, can be found in the four lessons of our stewardship campaign this year. Zacchaeus, Paul and Silas, the Good Samaritan, and the story of the mustard seed. I would encourage you to ponder those things. Earlier this year, in the newsletter, I shared with you that this year at the half year mark, 71 of our households were ahead or up to date in their giving 29% were behind the 50% mark, but all were trying. And together, we were accomplishing what needed to be accomplished. That's the way it is. When we all try together, we can accomplish what needs to be done and maybe even more. I grew up with the inspiration of John Wesley who said, do all you can, whenever you can, however you can. Now, having said that, I have to tell you right now that I am failing at something. I am losing a bet with my wife, and it is going to cost me one painful dollar if I lose. Now, nobody wants to lose in a bet to their wife, so I am going to redouble my efforts. But even if I lose, good is going to come from it. And I will not, have not, will not have felt bad for the commitment that I made. In all of our conditions and circumstances, we need one another to meet our goals. I've told you this before, that it is you as I got to know you that made me want to belong to this congregation. You inspire me. You help me be a better person. Help as many people to join you in ministry as you can. Now, we don't have time to do everything I wanted to do this morning, but I want you to turn to somebody who you're not related to and I want you to say thank you to them, okay? Now, okay, that's enough. Just thank you, not, you know, how you doing, what's happening. Now, after church, I want them to tell you something that they have done for the good of someone else in the last month. That's what you were thanking them for. But we don't have time to talk about that this morning because the people in the first service just kept talking and talking and talking. <laughs> The point here is to say we are all witnesses. And we need to be proud of the things that we witness to because it is for a good purpose. Make a commitment. Achieve that goal. Do good for others. What would you love to see stronger, more efficient? What ministry would you like to see more enabling, more powerful? Give it some of your good graces, and it will be. You will make a difference. And the Lord God will then say, thank you for making a difference. I want to conclude now simply with the thought that was passed on to us 
by Luke from Jesus. It is one of the most powerful scripture verses ever recorded. Everyone should know it, and if nothing else, try and follow it daily. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you will live. It was given in response to a lawyer's question. And you know when a lawyer asks you a question, you gotta really think about the answer you give. And Jesus nailed it with his answer. It addresses that answer, our relationship with God, our ability to make commitments, to stand for something eternally good, and it addresses our place in the community as individuals, as a congregation, and as part of the family of humankind. And it concludes with a powerful story about different responses to a human in need. Many good excuses were given in this powerful story, but only one hero emerged, the one who could put himself in another's shoes. So in the next month, I want you to consider putting on the carpenter's shoes, wearing the shoes of the fishermen and the tax collectors who followed Jesus, wear work boots, wingtips, high heels, flip-flops, wear slippers. But make the decision to join in the story of the Good Samaritan and decide, are you going to be an excuse maker or a first responder. Neither you nor I can follow Jesus by happenstance. We have to want to do it. A stewardship campaign is nothing if it is not about helping you articulate what you want and help you accomplish those desires. If you have a little time, choose one small thing. One evening at the soup kettle, one day at the pantry, three hours. If you have more time, teach Sunday school, lead the youth group, join a committee, but do something and give. Be better at sharing what you have. I don't care how poor you are. We are still part of the wealthiest nation in the world and we here today have more money than 95% of the rest of the world. We are the elite. We've been given much so we can be a blessing to others. We don't need a million dollars to be generous, and we don't need to be retired to have a little time. Remember how meaningful it has been when someone has shared your burden, when someone has gone the extra mile for you. Now be that person for someone else. One more hour, one more dollar, we can do it. In fact, we must. And best of all, then we will know the joy of generosity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.